Okay, so welcome back to this video on the Poisson process, where we are uh, trying to see how to derive the Poisson distribution probability mass function for the Poisson distribution uh, from the probability mass function for the binomial distribution. So I want to show you that e to the negative lambda t is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 minus lambda t over n uh, to the power of n, and I will show you this uh, from the definition of uh, differentiation, basically. So, uh, let's say we want to take the derivative with respect to x of e to the negative lambda t x. I think we should be able to do it from this. Right, uh, so we know how to do that just by using the chain rule. We know that this is going to become e to the negative lambda t x times negative lambda t. So that's the only uh, knowledge that I assume you know. Um, and I know it's kind of cheating that we are using this differentiation law to then go back and say, OK, we know the definition of differentiation. That's what we're going to do. It's kind of cheating, but basically, if you view the exponential function as being defined to be equal to the function that differentiates to make itself, then you can derive uh, this expression from that, basically. However, often you will see instead that the exponential function is defined thus via this limit, and instead you want to prove the other way around that it differentiates to make itself. We are assuming that you derive the, uh, sorry, you define the exponential function to be the function that differentiates to itself, and uh, then we'll prove this limit basically from that. Uh, so that's all what we're going to do. Okay, so if we go back to the fundamental definition of differentiation, it's the limit as uh, h approaches 0 of, uh, in fact, let me just write out what the derivative is. So let's say the derivative of an arbitrary function, sorry, that should have been derivative with respect to x. Uh, the derivative with respect to x of, uh, let's say, some arbitrary function f of x is just equal to the limit as f of uh, as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So it's basically the limiting, uh, the limit of the uh, gradient of the secant line. So basically, if you imagine having some function here, you have some point here, x, you take a tiny little value, h, and you add it on to go to x plus h, and then you take the gradient of the triangle, you join up the two pieces. So let me zoom it up. Here is x, here is x plus h. You have some function like this. You basically join the two points like that, uh, with a straight line, and you are taking the gradient of that function, because you are asking, what is their difference in height? What is this difference here? What is their difference in uh, uh, difference part in the x-axis, which is h? Uh, so this is f of x. This is f of x plus h. So you're basically taking the gradient of the secant line. You then take the limit of that as h approaches 0. Another way of saying the limit as h approaches 0 is to say the limit as n approaches infinity, and it replaces uh, h with 1 over n, basically, so f of x plus 1 over n minus f of x divided by 1 over n. So now, uh, what, as n approaches infinity, 1 over n approaches 0, so this limit should be the same as that limit because h and 1 over n are basically the same thing. Okay, uh, so uh, now, uh, if this limit exists, then this limit should equal the same thing as it, basically. Okay, uh, so uh, now, uh, let's pu uh, put in, in place of just an arbitrary function, f of x, let's replace it with e to the negative lambda t x. And as far as this derivative is concerned, lambda t is just a constant. So, uh, this derivative becomes the limit as n approaches infinity of e to the negative lambda t x plus 1 over n, so the function evaluated at x plus 1 over n, minus e to the negative lambda t x, so the function evaluated at x, divided by 1 over n. Okay? Right. Uh, so, now we can split this up. Um, let's go on to the next piece of paper. So I'll just recap, uh, rewrite out what we've got. We've got that the derivative with respect to x of e to the negative lambda t x. Well, firstly, we just did it by the chain rule and said that it was going to be lambda t e to the negative lambda t x. And you just get that from the fact that uh, we defined, basically, if you define the exponential function to be the function that differentiates to the set itself, then by the chain rule of differentiation, it implies that the derivative of this function here is this. Uh, then, uh, 
what we said is go back to the original definition of differentiation, and it's the limit as n approaches infinity of um, e to the negative lambda t x plus 1 over n minus, sorry, minus down here, e to the negative lambda t x divided by 1 over n. Okay, now split this out. So firstly, dis uh, expand this bracket and then split the two exponentials up. So that becomes the limit as n approaches infinity of e to the negative lambda t x times uh, e to the um, e to the negative lambda t over n min uh, minus e to the negative lambda t x divided by one over n. Okay, right, now pull out the e to the negative lambda t. It plays no part in the limit, so we might as well pull it out. So we get e to the negative lambda t x, and then we get the limit as n approaches infinity, and I pulled it out from both terms. We get the limit as n approaches infinity of e to the negative lambda t over n minus 1 over 1 over n. Okay, right. Now, this was going to be equal to this side over here. So this had to be equal to negative lambda t e to the negative lambda t x. So we can now cancel this off both sides because it's an exponential. So it's always positive. So it's never equal to zero. So you can divide it on both sides. It, its multiplicative inverse always exists. OK, so then what we get is that negative lambda t is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of uh, e to the negative lambda t over n minus 1 divided by 1 over n. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, now, what we imagine doing is, uh, this is a little bit, um, little bit dodgy, but what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, remember that n is approaching infinity, and now let's just play around with this a bit. So, let's Imagine multiplying both sides by 1 over n. So that means multiply this side by 1 over n here. And we've got that this is e to the negative lambda t over n. So just remember, n is converging on infinity. Uh, converging on infinity, yes. Uh, this relationship should still be hot true, shouldn't it? Okay. So as n approaches infinity, this side should approach this side, basically, if this limit is going to be equal to that. Okay, uh, that really just follows from the fact that uh, you can split up the uh, top and the bottom limit. Well, um, uh, yes, you can split, uh, well, it, it's a little bit dodgy to do so because the bottom limit is going to be equal to zero. Uh, but then if you multiply it up instantly, it still holds true. Uh, so, um, yeah, so if you can, you can multiply this limit up here and then put on both sides, basically. Uh, so then bring this 1 over here, and we get the e to the negative lambda t over n is going to equal 1 minus lambda t over n, basically. And then what we do is we raise both sides to the power of n to get the e to the negative lambda t is equal to 1 minus lambda t over n to the power of n. And now we just remember that n was pr approaching infinity. So we can replace in, the we should replace in, the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 minus lambda t over n to the power of n is equal to e to the negative lambda t. Okay, so excuse the sloppy sort of applied maths here, but it's good intuition. It's a good intuitive argument that just remember n is approaching zero, bring it up here, and then uh, rewrite it so that you get e to the negative lambda t is equal to this limit. So that's why, uh, that's a nice intuitive argument for why that limit is equal to e to the negative lambda t. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, so we've got e to the negative lambda t there. Then here uh, we have 1 minus lambda t over n to the power of negative x. Negative x is some finite value. n is approaching infinity. This converges on being 0. We're then raising 1 minus something that converges on being 0 to a finite power. The difference between this and this is here we were raising 1 minus something that's converging on 0 to the power of something that's converging on infinity. So we're, uh, we're, um, we're taking 1 minus something tiny, uh, infinitesimal, and raising it to the power of something infinite. And that's how you somehow miraculously got something that was bigger than 1 out of that. Whereas here, you're taking 1, you're subtracting something infinitesimal off, and then you're just raising it to the power of something finite. That's just going to still be equal to 1, basically. Okay. So, now, the overall result of this is that we end up 
we end up with this bit here, e to the negative lambda t remaining, this has gone to 1, this has gone to 1 as well, this bit remains out here, and that therefore overall becomes the probability mass function uh, for this random variable that we had originally that was xt. So the probability that xt is equal to little x is going to equal the grand um, finale, e to the negative lambda t times lambda t to the power of x over x factorial, basically. And that's the probability mass function for a Poisson distribution. So basically, xt is Poisson distributed uh, with parameter lambda t. Okay, so the number of emails that you are likely to receive in time little t is going to be Poissonly distributed with mean uh, lambda t, basically. And that, I hope, is a nice uh, reminder of, um, of um, how, where the Poisson distribution comes from. And by the way, xt, the uh, process of receiving emails, would then be said to be a Poisson process. xt is a Poisson process. So that's what a Poisson process is. It's just something which is which is distributed Poissonly.